My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership. Welcome to episode three with Ian Ziskin, who has over 40 years of experience as a business leader, board advisor, board member, coach, consultant, entrepreneur, teacher, speaker, and author. That's a lot. His global leadership experience includes chief human resource officer and other senior roles at three Fortune 100 companies, Northrop Grumman, Quest Communications, and TRW, and has written dozens of articles, blogs, and book chapters on the future of work, leadership, coaching, and the role of HR within boards of directors and the business more broadly. In 2007, he was selected as a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, considered to be the highest honors for HR professionals. I cannot wait to welcome Ian to the program. Thanks for being here. Great to be here, Lacey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So for our listeners, um, you're going to seem a little different than the normal guests we have on the show often. And I want to be really transparent about why that is. And the reason is, is uh, Ian Ziskin is joining us today because yes, he's done some amazing things in his career. And yes, he's led some amazing organizations and some amazing teams. But why he's here today is because Ian and I have had a longstanding business relationship, friendship, and ultimately he's been one of the most impactful uh, influencers or mentors in my life. So I don't think I could get through season two without having him join us in that way. So I'm excited to have Ian on and to get us started. Ian, talk to us a little bit about who you are, uh, where you come from and what you're doing today. Well, I'm a person who's had about 41 years in uh, the HR and leadership space. Very fortunate to have stumbled into a career that I've loved. Essentially two separate but very related chunks. I spent um, 28 years uh, working in HR for large companies. Toward the latter part of my corporate life, I was the chief HR officer for two companies, most recently a company called Northrop Grumman in the aerospace and defense business. Uh, and then about 13 years ago, launched my own coaching and consulting firm called Exec Excel Group, which is a portfolio of a variety of, of things. I've also loved a lot of coaching, a lot of leadership development, a lot of advisory work for more entrepreneurial kinds of companies and some writing of books and speaking to go along with all of that. So I consider myself somebody quite lucky to have spent a long time doing lots of things that I really love. I live in a place called Sag Harbor, New York, which is on the east end of Long Island. I'm originally from the New York area, but have lived all over the country and traveled all over the world as part of my career. And uh, proudly will say that I've been married to the same woman for 41 years and have three grown sons. And I think grandpa uh, is sort of the newest job that you've uh, enjoyed pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah, I've really, really enjoyed uh, the grandpa role. And it, it teaches you a lot, of course, about what's important in life and uh, also teaches you a lot about uh, learning and how people develop, you know, watching a soon to be three year old and a one and a half year old explore and discover. For you personally, when you think about beginning to where you are today, what are some of the the moments that you look back at and you're most proud, uh, most proud of, most excited by? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if I had to just pick a couple of things that really have stuck with me, uh, I would first go to uh, very early in my career uh, I had the privilege of participating in uh, what was then called the Management Associates Program. It was a two-year rotational development program when I first uh, began my career with a company called TRW. And um, the thing that really uh, hit me at that time was that most of the people that I was working with and, and likely going to be working with for, for quite a while longer uh, were all going to be uh, substantially older and more experienced than me and had been around the block, you know, more than a few times. And I had a ton of things to learn from them, but they were also expecting me to contribute and to eventually uh, lead them, even though I was, again, you know, younger and less experienced than many of them and uh, discovered somehow or another, you know, fairly early in my career that uh, listening and being willing to admit what you don't know and learn from other people uh, turned out to be a pretty effective strategy. L later in my career, we're going now, you know, a couple of decades later uh, to uh, my first uh, chief HR officer job. Uh, I had a similar 
inflection point, if you will, in terms of learning and, and personal development, because I was leaving a, a company that I had been with for 18 and a half years at that point, TRW, where I'd grown up, going to a completely new company in a completely new industry in the telecommunications space where I knew no one uh, and knew very little about uh, the business and had to figure out, quite frankly, pretty quickly how to uh, understand how the business made money and develop credibility and build the kinds of relationships that are required to ask people to do difficult and challenging things. Uh, and then maybe the final inflection point uh, would be my second chief HR officer job, in at least the corporate sense, of uh, coming to the realization that I was getting to work for uh, a CEO, a guy by the name of Ron Sugar, who was a longtime uh, mentor of mine and somebody I had worked with earlier in my career, and the chance to uh, partner with somebody who was an incredible leader, uh, but also an incredible person, and learn from uh, the kinds of things that he made uh, important, uh, the kinds of things that he concluded were uh, you know, not as important, even though you could easily get upset or tweaked by some of the things that you had to struggle with in order to get done in the business environment. I learned a lot about prioritization and what really matters in life and business from him. And at least in my corporate life, those were three pretty important inflection points for me. Yeah, I think I've learned from the stories that you've told me about Dr. Sugar as well. He clearly had a, a big impact on everything that you've done. And I've only had the chance to meet him once. And um, I could see how all of that could ring very true. Well, I, I found him to be somebody who had a, he was always the smartest person in the room, literally. Uh, you know, man is brilliant, uh, but he never made people feel that way. Uh, and he always, listened and could take a, a point of view and a perspective from somebody else who might be less experienced or differently experienced than him and always found a way to value it and, and benefit from it. So I learned a ton uh, from watching him in action. I think you've had the same impact on me. Definitely kept me out of trouble. Um, going back to your first point, something kind of jumped out to me. So I'm not going to lie. I've always kind of wondered why, uh, with all of your career success, with all of the network that you have, with all of the opportunities that came your way, why you would partner up with a 20-something person um, that you had crossed paths with, who was a consultant that worked for you. Um, and then you just told the story about being the youngest person in the room and sort of going through that learning. And, and I'm wondering, did 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 that experience have any impact on why why you partnered with me, why you came my way? Because I've always wondered. I know I've asked you, and you've given me some answers. But, you know, maybe have you dig in a bit more. Now's the opportunity to tell you the truth, really. That's right. That's right. About, about why I did. Well, look, you know, first of all, you know, I, I won't take too much of the credit. I'll, I'll give you the credit because, you know, it was very obvious to me, you know, when I first met you, but also as we continued to interact with one another. Uh, that you were somebody who uh, gets things done, uh, which I highly value. You know, if I, as I got to know you both as a professional and as a, a person and a friend, it was very obvious to me that you were somebody who could juggle a million things simultaneously and somehow or another figured out how to get them all done. That's something that, you know, I greatly admire in people and I, I certainly admire it in, in you for sure. Uh, but there's also a, a more of a selfish element, I guess, to it, which is, you know, as I was, you know, especially leaving corporate life and going the more entrepreneurial route of starting my coaching and consulting business, you know, it was very obvious to me that the the network of people that I was going to be building and wanting to build was going to have to be much more diverse and diversified then even though I had, a, I think, a very good network coming into building my business, I recognized it was going to be nowhere near what it needed to be in order for me to build a long-term, sustainable, successful business. And to my way of thinking, rightly or wrongly at the time, uh, I was thinking about um, you, know, you and people also like you who were different than me in experience base, 
but also different generation. I mean, recognizing that I was 52 when I started my coaching and consulting business and, you know, to reach out to somebody in their 20s to me was, you know, very selfish, but in a in a thoughtful way in the sense of, you know, we could complement one another in a number of different ways and you would bring something to the partnership that I could not bring. And that is something also i would say that i learned from you know my early career mm. getting tossed into different jobs that by all rights i was not ready for with enough years of experience or or age perhaps under my belt to necessarily uh, be justified in expecting to be put into those jobs and quite often frankly i was not expecting to be put into those jobs uh, that happened as a result of other people investing in me. And so I learned a lot early on about the value of collaborating with and partnering with and relying on other people who brought other things to the table so that we could all succeed. And frankly, I, you know, I saw that in you uh, instantly, and that's really why I reached out to you to encourage and and hope that you know you would agree to work collaboratively. And here we are, many years later, still speaking to each other, which I <laughs> consider to be quite an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely stuck with me. You have no choice in the matter, and I agree with all of those things. And then I just like to add one additional point, which is I always thought it was really fun for people to try to figure out how the heck we know each other and how the heck we came to work together because that was always an adventure for me as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know most most people would not necessarily see the the partnership that we formed as um traditional yeah. or predictable but uh, to be honest i mean it's really one of the things i'm most proud of about you know our relationship is that it's not traditional it's not predictable and many people <laughs> scratch their heads you know trying to figure it all out but i think that gave us actually a a very distinct uh, competitive advantage if i can say it that way yeah absolutely absolutely and the examples and the leadership and the ability to learn from you over the years has been, it's its too hard to quantify, actually. Um, but again, you're one of the things I'm most grateful for in my career, and I recognize the impact that it's had. And I recognize the impact it's had as you start to think about doing things differently um, in your life, like being grandpa and spending more time contributing back to the function and to business in a variety of different ways. But Thinking about the impact that you've had on me personally from a leadership perspective, when you think about leadership, when you think about key focus areas, when you think about the people that you work with from an executive coaching perspective, what are some of the, the things that rise to the top in terms of abilities or criteria or things that you've seen in leaders that set uh, some people apart from others? Well, I think the the number one thing that I kind of alluded to earlier when I was describing you is the ability to get things done. There's really no substitute for delivering results. However, there are a lot of leaders in the world who are pretty good at getting things done and delivering results. Unfortunately, they also leave a wake of dead bodies, you know, trailing behind them because their approach to getting things done uh, is not very user friendly. So, you know, as a result, a lot of the best leaders that I've ever been around or had the the good fortune to coach or work for or work with uh, were always people who got a ton of things done and were able to accomplish a lot. But the way that they do it is in a highly collaborative way where they energize the people around them and they bring out the best in these other people and somehow or another give those other individuals a sense of confidence and self-worth that they have a lot to contribute. You know, if you if you're good at doing all of those other things in addition to delivering results, you can have a huge multiplier effect on uh, everybody else's capability to step up and do amazing things. And the best leaders that I've been around uh, are very good at doing all of that. And I've, I've tried to emulate that. It takes me to a lot of the pro bono coaching work that I do with college students or earlier career professionals, which to some extent um, are struggling with the, the get things done 
in a variety of ways. And we can talk a little bit more about that, but also all of the other components that are showing up in work today. What's your reaction to that? Does that make sense, first of all? And then what's your reaction if it does? Yeah, well, first of all, yes, it, ma- it makes sense, but it, it makes even more sense to me now because, you know, speaking of pro bono, one of the things that, that I've embarked on fairly recently over the course of the last few months is um, I started teaching an MBA course at my undergraduate alma mater, Binghamton University. And the course focuses on uh, driving business performance through people and HR leadership. That's the name of the the course. But what I've learned from working with uh, 27 students who are in this class is that, um, you know, at, at this age and stage of life, you know, this generation, obviously, as you can imagine, you know, has grown up a little differently than somebody uh, of my age and stage of life, you know, with a different set of priorities and a different way of thinking about solving problems and approaching the world. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to teach all of them uh, a little bit about, you know, the thought process that's required to get things done effectively through people as a leader uh, inside of organizations when many of them have not yet had the experience of working extensively <laughs> in you know large complex organizations they on the other hand are teaching me quite a bit about you know the flexibility and the freedom and the ways of working that they prefer you know as as this generation you know coming into the workforce that really challenges, you know, a lot of conventional wisdoms about how organizations run and how somebody who's had a 40 plus year career like me uh, has grown up and the the type of accommodation that you have to make. And I say that uh, with a positive tone to it rather than a negative tone to it, the type of accommodation that you have to make to People who have, you know, very different ways of learning and very different ways of processing things. All of these folks, of course, are going to be going into the workforce and challenging all the conventional wisdoms of leadership and of human resources as a profession because they expect much higher degrees of uh, flexibility and freedom. But they also uh, expect and and demand uh, a much higher degree of influence and transparency about what's going on in the organization than certainly I would have expected, you know, when I was coming out of graduate school 40 plus years ago. For the leaders that are listening to us today that are mid-career and the challenge that's so clear to you, to me, to others out there, there's been a, you know, a plethora of articles written on this topic. How do you reconcile that? What should they be doing? How should they be thinking about managing across these multi-generations? Well, I think the first thing you have to do if you're going to be a leader or a manager in a multi-generational workforce is to recognize that every person's perspective, no matter what generation they represent or what aspect of diversity they represent, uh, they have a legitimate point of view, even if it's different than yours. Uh, and that's actually you know one of the more important personal learnings for me is, you know, I have a set of filters, just like we all do, about, you know, what constitutes good leadership, what constitutes a good employee, and somebody who's going to contribute to the success of the organization. And I've had to uh, let go of, or at least reconsider, some of those filters because of the the different ways of working that people bring to the workforce now. The second thing uh, this, this is true for any leader in any position everywhere forever. This hasn't changed, but we haven't gotten that much better at it. And that is listening, uh, you know, and doing a lot of listening more than you're telling people about what to do and how to do it. So whether it's, you know, students in this class that I'm teaching or clients that I'm coaching or uh, consulting with, uh, I have found that you learn a lot more by listening to other people's perspective and point of view than you do by telling them what to do. And it turns out most leaders struggle with that a bit because they still think the primary role of leadership is to actually direct and tell other people what they should be doing. There's a a small element of, you know, providing direction and telling. You have to provide some, some guidance to people to be an effective leader. But 
I think one of the better ways to know how to guide people is to first listen to the challenges and the problems and the obstacles that they're trying to overcome, as well as the ideas that they have for addressing those things more effectively, because I don't care how much experience they have or don't have, or what their age or generation is. Uh, usually, if you listen, uh, people have very good ideas about how to make the environment around everybody uh, much better and more effective. Yeah. Go to the flip side of that. So think about your class entering, re-entering the workforce as they finish their MBA. Um, what's the advice you have? You tell them um, as they think about working for a leader that's probably 20 years their senior, 15 years their senior? Well, yeah, it turns out that uh, most of the students who are getting ready to graduate from any MBA program, I think, including the one that, that I'm involved in, first of all, are overly worried and overly focused that the job that they get coming out of grad school and the boss that they work for coming out of grad school must be the perfect one in all dimensions. And if it isn't, somehow that's going to negatively influence uh, their entire career for the next 40 years. So I, I try to start out by disabusing them of that notion, because in my experience, uh, what matters more is the first three, five, seven, even 10 years of one's career and the variety of experience that you get over that period of time is really what will serve as the foundation that will shape you and your career for the next 30 or 40 years, rather than the one first job that you take coming out of grad school. So uh, I try to recommend to people a combination of the following sorts of things to pay attention to. One, am I going to work for a great boss? Two, do I have the opportunity to learn from and work with uh, really good peers? Uh, three, what's the the challenge you know that's associated with the, the the job, and can I actually learn something and contribute something uh, for with a sense of purpose? You know, does the sense of purpose of the organization and the people I'm going to be working with align with my own personal sense of purpose or or mission? Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, is it an ethical organization that expects people to operate ethically? Because if it isn't, I don't care how smart you are, how capable you are, you'll you'll never be able to change uh, the culture of an organization fast enough to go from being unethical to uh, ethical. So I've come to realize through that last statement um, that your MBA course is uh, roughly based on your experience with me over the last 20 plus years, because <laughs> I don't know how many times, in my words, these weren't yours, which is calm down, take a breath. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Well, there should be a picture of you that we keep, you know, constantly uh, uh, up in front of the, the class to you be the symbol, I suppose, of a lot of the things that we're, we're trying to teach. Yeah. It's a funny thing. It's And again, those conversations are flashing back in my head as you're talking, but it is a funny thing because we do at that stage in our lives and our careers feel like everything matters so much. And yes, it's important, um, but the impact that it really has versus the impact we give it in those moments is just so much larger. Most of the learning over the course of my career, at least, has come from the things that I didn't expect. You know, problems that came out of the blue or somebody you thought was going to be a great boss who wasn't, or the organization that you went into you thought was going to be growing and doing fantastic things. And all of a sudden you discovered that the business was going down the tank and you had to help figure out how to you know, cause it to survive. Those types of unexpected twists and turns and how you end up dealing with and responding to those things, that's really where a lot of the learning comes from. Because as the saying goes over and over again, you, you can't control a lot of things that happen to you, but you actually can control the way that you respond to it and how you learn from it. I've always tried at least to take those kinds of negative or uncertain situations and turn them into something uh, positive, positive, not necessarily meaning fun or what you would prefer, but at least yeah. positive from the point of view, can you get something out of this in terms of learning and and uh, minimizing the risk of you know making similar mistakes in the future? 
Yeah. And I actually think you're one of the best at that. So I, I think about your career. I don't know if I've ever said this to you, but I think about your career in sort of three acts, right? So it's sort of the corporate component, the consulting component, and this place where you're at today, which is um, how do you give back? How do you think about what comes next from a legacy perspective? And how do you do the amazing things you're doing with your family, right? So for me, it's sort of broken down in those three ways. And in a lot of ways, I, I aspire to, to replicate that, right? I don't know if it's been as easy and maybe it just appears easy to me, but I don't know if it's as easy for others. I know that they, that our listeners would really love to have a, an understanding or some advice or help in terms of how you navigated all of those pretty big changes because they're real and your level of success from my perspective, again, has grown with each of them, which is also not common. Well, th- thanks for the compliment. I appreciate it. But I, I can assure you, and, and as well as your listeners, that none of the things that I've done or the transitions that I've made uh, have been smooth or easy. I actually think maybe the single biggest requirement of making the kinds of transitions that I've made in my life and career, from you know corporate life to more of an entrepreneurial existence, you know, running my own business to now trying to uh, make more time to, you know, give back, uh, do more pro bono things and, and also spend more time uh, with with family and, and friends. A lot of that has involved a, a couple of things that, you know, I suppose most people are not comfortable with, but I think you have to be in order to do this well. One is it, recognizing that you're likely going to try some stuff and fail. Uh, you know, for example, I recognized when I was leaving big company life and building my own business that I had no idea whether I was going to be any good at or like business development, uh, especially growing up as a, an HR person inside of big companies. Usually the, you know, the problems find you, so you don't have to go out and find the problems. And so when you're building your own business, as you well know, because you've done it very successfully, uh, you have no idea whether you know anybody's going to take your phone call or respond to your email, or you know certainly you don't have any idea whether they want to hire you and, and pay you any money to do the the work that you might do on their behalf. So I concluded pretty early that the only way I was going to find out if I was any good at it or if I liked it was to actually try it, and that requires a certain degree of willingness to fail and fail fast and learn from what you're doing and make adjustments and tweaks along the way. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, kindly would say you've been very successful at building your own business and, you know, that's it's nice to hear, but I would also say, you know, below the surface, that's required a lot of experimentation and trying things and piloting things and recognizing what's working and pretty quickly figuring out what's not working so you can change direction. Um, the other thing that I've had to learn how to do, both in building my own business, but now maybe even more importantly at this phase of life, uh, trying to spend more time giving back and and uh, spending time with family too, is I've really had to get better at saying no because I happen to be one of these people who uh, you know gets attracted to a lot of things. I have a wide diversity of interests. I have this curse of wanting to help people. And, you know, all of those things involve uh, saying yes and getting involved in a lot of stuff. And I've always loved the variety that's very energizing to me. And if I can make a difference in people's lives and contribute in some way, that feels great. But uh, if you're going to travel less, get more control over your time, uh, spend more time doing pro bono things, spend more time with your family. For me, what's what that has required, at least in part, is being able to say no to certain things that I historically would have said yes to, uh, and also handing certain things off that I would have been in, more directly and personally involved in in the past to other people who I trust. You know, whether it's you, Lacey, or other people who are a part of our consortium of of colleagues. But I can assure you that saying no and letting go of some of the things that I've historically been very deeply involved in has not been easy. For the individual, whether they're transitioning from corporate to entrepreneurial, whether they're transitioning from one job to the next, or they're redefining themselves because they want to do something that they're passionate about, that they're energized by, and that that fear of failure, that risk is there, how do they work through that? 
Well, I, I'm a firm believer that failure, if you're doing enough difficult things, is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, if your mentality is such that you're trying to isolate away from the inevitability of failure before you try something, you'll probably never get anything important or difficult off the ground. Therefore, part of the mentality needs to be baking some failure into the equation as you try things and learn and grow. The second aspect of that, which I have, again, you know, it's kind of an acquired taste. I've learned this by, by trial and error and, and making some mistakes is uh, I think it's better to fail small and fast rather than big and slow. And so, uh, you know, as you're going to try new things in life, whatever they may be, for those people who are listening, I don't think you have to do it all at once. I don't think you have to go super big. I don't think you have to spend millions of dollars. I don't think you have to risk your entire life and entire career. I think what you can do is try things in experimental fashion, pilot them in smaller, more bite-sized, digestible chunks see if it works. If it does, do a little bit more. Uh, if there's something about it that doesn't work, figure out what's not working and make some adjustments along the way. And it's more of an iterative rather than an all or none kind of philosophy. And, you know, you kind of have to go slow to go fast, I think, in this regard, because while it might seem slower to experiment and try things and pilot and iterate like I've been describing. Actually, I think it's it's actually slower to go full bore for something that you're not really sure how to do, fail miserably, and then you have to back up completely and start completely over again. That's really slow because you have to undo all the things that you just did and begin back at the beginning as opposed to, I try it, I iterate, I practice, I pilot, I do it in digestible chunks, I learn from what I'm doing, and then I start making a little bit of headway and get some traction. We always hear about the big failures or the big risks that have paid off, but we don't actually hear, we don't read stories about, we don't read articles about the individual who iterated and got there over time and finally you know, was where they, they wanted to be. When you think about those moments of risk or failure in your career, do you have any stories you're comfortable sharing with us? Well, yeah, I think one one of the one of the failures I, I had in my career going back, you know, twenty plus years ago, was my first chief HR officer role that I was describing a little bit about earlier, where it was you know completely new industry, uh, geographic move, going to a business that I knew nothing about, you know, working for people that I had no prior relationships with, and, and one of my big aspects of failure, I don't know if it was you know naivete or arrogance or both. But I was going to work for a CEO who, at the time, you know, had had a reputation for being extremely difficult to work for and, and a little bit crazy to go along with it. And uh, you know, I knew about that reputation, but I was so uh, excited about the opportunity for my first chief HR officer role, and uh, you know, I had just enough confidence, I suppose, you know, in my own ability that I managed to convince myself that, you know, I could coach and change this guy, you know, to being a more user-friendly version of himself. But it turns out that uh, life lesson for me was you can't coach DNA. There are certain things that are just fundamental to a human being and who they are and, and how they want to carry themselves. And I don't care how good you are as a CHRO or as a coach or as a leader or as a consultant of any kind. Somebody who doesn't want to be a better version of themselves or change to be more effective, you know, isn't going to be changed by you, no matter how good or how smart you you think you may be. So for me, uh, you know, it was a, a bit of a failure in the sense of believing that I could have more influence over someone who was, uh, you know, very experienced, certainly had been around um, business a lot longer than me, but also had you know, his own comfort level with the, the aggressive and difficult style that he used, which, you know, turned out not to serve him very well. But, you know, he had a hard time seeing that. So uh, I think about that a lot 
even still today, not so much in terms of trying something that didn't work, but more from the perspective of, you know, understand where you can make a difference and put your energy into those places where you can make a difference, as opposed to banging your head against the wall, trying to change a person or an organization or a culture in places that really don't want to be different, don't want to change. And no matter how good or effective you are as a, as a leader, uh, you're not going to get any traction in those types of environments. Across the board, leadership is hard. You have been around, you've had more experience with more accomplished leaders than I think anyone that I know. Why is leadership so hard? Why is this well, hard? Why is this a tough gig? Because fundamentally, you're leading human beings who are you know, unpredictable and in some ways um, selfish. I don't mean that in the completely pejorative sense. What I mean is that people have a tendency to focus on self-interest you know, for themselves, their careers. They want to make sure their families are taken care of. They want to make sure that the organizations that they're part of are successful. And that's messy. You know, I think people are competitive as opposed to uh, being as maybe more collaborative uh, as I would prefer that they be. At least that's a little more consistent with my own uh, style and, and preferred way of working. And I also think that that leaders have a challenge because especially in today's environment, we're really asking people to change almost everything simultaneously and very fast. And even if you're the most adventurous person on the planet, most people have some limit to the capacity for the amount of change and uncertainty that they can handle at any given point in time. And everything that we're doing in not only uh, business, but in the world at large is challenging that notion because so many things are changing so quickly and people don't really have anything to grab onto or hold on to anymore that seems familiar uh, and comfortable. So what's the advice we give those people recognizing that it's hard, recognizing there's a lot changing in the world and there's not a lot to hold on to? How, how do we help them through that? Well, you know, as, as you well know, because you contributed to this book, you know, we had this experience of writing this book together in a highly collaborative way with a bunch of us over the course of the last couple of years called the, the Secret Sauce for Leading Transformational Change. And one of the things that I, I learned from that, you know, for me, a big aha in, in being the lead author of the book is that, you know, it is in fact true that people hate change. As cynical as that sounds, I came to the conclusion that most people actually do hate change. You know, the only thing we have going for us is that they hate something else even more, which is failure. And so to the degree that you can cause people to feel like uh, there's an opportunity to win mm -hmm. as a person and as a team and as an organization, maybe even as a, a community or society, winning involves doing some things differently and better than what we've historically done. I think you've got a 51% chance of getting even people who hate change to join in and be part of it because nobody really wants to fail and nobody really wants to be part of a losing organization or um, team. And therefore, uh, it's really all about what are the things that we need to do differently or better. The other thing which I would emphasize from the experience of writing this book is that human beings, for whatever reason, seem to have this limitless capacity to deny, deflect, dismiss facts or data that do not reinforce their preferred view of the internal or external environment. And one of our big challenges, I think, as, as leaders of any organization is to cause people to see reality. You know, what is it that we're in the middle of in the moment that is causing the need for change, even though it might be uncertain or uncomfortable? Uh, if we do a pretty good job as leaders of bringing truth and reality to the perspective and, and mindset of the people who are around us, again, I think we have a 51% chance of getting over the hump of resistance to, to change. If we allow 
uh, individuals as well as the organizations we're part of not to operate in uh, reality and not to focus on the truth that we're facing. It's extremely difficult to get people to let go of whatever they've been doing for the past 20 or 30 years, even if it's not working. Yeah, it's interesting. You're talking about letting go and truth and reality and changes being hard. And the word that keeps popping in my head is giving something, giving people something that they care about. Am I completely off that that's running in my head or am I reading between the lines there? Like the care, the the uh, motivation, the desire that for me is all built under that wanting to win piece. Yeah, I, I think I think it is, you know, and there's a maybe it's an overused word these days that a lot of people are using called purpose. Right. And, you know, to what degree can you align the sense of purpose of the individual with the sense of purpose of the organization? And if there is high alignment, uh, again, I think you have a better chance of of succeeding. But even with all of that, going back to your your question a few minutes ago about why is leadership so hard, I do believe there's all kinds of uh, examples out there in the world where the the individual has you know a set of things you know inside you know maybe in their head and their heart about what really matters to them and what's really important and they're in search of a place or a leader that they can align with that feels good because there's high alignment between what really matters to them, the individual, and what matters to the organization or the leader that they might be partnering with. When you can find that alignment, it's like gold. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's elusive for sure, but I haven't given up, you know, 41 years into it, I'm still looking for, you know, ways to help people find that degree of alignment and therefore fulfillment uh, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in the work environment that they're in, but there's no doubt that it's elusive. Just because it's elusive doesn't mean you give up. It's like you and I have talked about many times in the in the past. You know, nothing worth doing is really ever easy, and that's very inconvenient. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a classic <laughs> example of you know nothing worth doing is ever easy because you're basically trying to align. Uh, a, a nameless, faceless, you know, somewhat impersonal organization with a set of objectives with a bunch of human beings who actually have feelings and priorities and a sense of purpose and what they're trying to achieve in their lives for themselves and their families and, and others who are important to them. And finding that connection is, you know, kind of the holy grail, but it's also messy in an environment where everything around us is constantly changing. And some of the best leaders that I'm around, even still these days, are people who do a really good job of painting the picture and a compelling view, if you will, of of what the connection is between what the organization is trying to achieve and what the individuals who are part of that organization uh, are going to do to contribute to it. That's a bit of a of a distinguishing factor as well for highly successful leaders in today's environment. There are so many tidbits of great advice that I've captured in terms of being comfortable with failure, building failure in, building that network, um, perception and reconciling your values with how you're showing up and calming down, taking a breath and what's the worst that's going to happen. All of those things have been a huge impact on the last 20 plus, we're going to say 20, even though I know it's way more than that now, 20 plus years you've been in my life. What's the last piece of advice that you want to give listeners today? The one or two things that you want really to stick with them as we finish up today? Well, you know, the last few years, uh, probably a lot of this driven by COVID, I've had to learn to appreciate empathy much more than perhaps I ever have. And now I think it extends even beyond COVID to a lot of the the change and uncertainty that that we've been talking about today, Lacey. I I think if we can be more empathetic people and try to put ourselves in the position of understanding what the other person we're interacting with might be going through, uh, it actually will give us a much better chance, not only of being effective leaders, but being 
more effective members of society, you know, in a world where there's a lot of conflict and disagreement and it's, you know, much more polarized than I, I think I've ever seen before in my life. If we can all be slightly more empathetic in terms of understanding how the other person might be thinking and why they might be thinking that, I think the world will be a better place. That's, that's a great note to end on. I cannot thank you enough for joining me today. And I know the impact that this podcast is going to have on everyone else out there as, as, as have our 20 years of uh, relationship had on me. Thank you so much for joining us. Love being with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Ian. What I'm left with are questions around how you're helping your leaders align their values with the company, how you can help people fail fast to learn more. And overall, in this complicated, confusing world, how your leadership impacts the world and your team and your organization positively. This is Unfolding Leadership. Thanks for listening.